بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى آلك المظلومين المشردين عن الأوطان صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيم قال الله العزيز الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي There is no compulsion in religion Verily guidance has become clear from error For the love of the mercy to the world Our holy prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Please recite and love salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I would like to offer my condolences to our 12th Imam, the awaited Savior, the one who will fill this world with justice and equity, just as it is filled now with injustice and oppression. Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadar, may Allah hasten his reappearance to our great scholars and ulama, to the Muslim world, to you brothers and sisters, on the martyrdom anniversary of the seal of Allah's prophets and messengers, the best of Allah's creation, the mercy to the world, our Holy Prophet Muhammad Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Tonight we're commemorating the anniversary of our Holy Prophet The Muslims have been deeply pained Their beloved Prophet has passed away And especially for his kith and kin It is one of their lives saddest day truly it is one of the greatest calamities that befell the ummah of the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the loss of allah's greatest creation in ziyarat al-rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam we say usibna bika ya habib qulubina fama a'zam al-musibata bik حيث انقطع عنا الوحي وحيث فقدناك We are struck with a calamity which is your loss O oh, the beloved of our hearts How great is this calamity Because there are two sides to it One is that we have lost the revelation There is no more revelation coming down and the other is your loss, O Prophet of Allah. We lost you. We lost the mercy to the world. We lost our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. I have not found better words than the words of his successor, Amir al muminin Alayhi Salam, when he described and showed the impact of his loss. Uh, to the Ummah, to the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam Amir Al-Mu'mineen says كان في الأرض أمانان 
كان في الأرض أمانان من عذاب الله وقد رفع أحدهما فدونكم الآخر فتمسكوا به There are two sources of deliverance and relief from Allah's punishment. One which has been raised up while the other is before you. So make sure that you hold on to it. أما الأمان الذي يرفع فهو رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وأما الأمان الباقي فالاستغفار قال الله تعالى وما كان الله ليعذبهم وأنت فيهم وما كان الله معذبهم وهم يستغفرون The source of deliverance which has been raised up is Allah's Messenger. And the source of deliverance and relief from Allah's chastisement that remains is seeking forgiveness, is repenting to Allah, istighfar. Allah, the glorified, said, and Allah is not to chastise them when you, when the Prophet is amongst them, nor is Allah to chastise them when they are in the state of repentance, when they are seeking forgiveness. Indeed, Allah will not punish an ummah when the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is amongst them. For the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is sent to be a mercy to the world. Our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam opened his eyes to a world played with ignorance and smeared with gross inequity. The rich exploited the poor. He lived in this world where the rich exploited the poor, where the white subjugated the black, where women were bought and sold as commodities. At a young age, our Holy Prophet ﷺ knew that all these external injustices stem from the internal ailments and sicknesses of the heart. Our Holy Prophet ﷺ dedicated the entirety of his life teaching humanity how to become virtuous. He conquered the world. He transformed the world, but not through military might. He transformed the world with the power of his gentle smile and his magnanimous character. The Holy Prophet ﷺ says, تَبَسُّمُكَ فِي وَجْهِ أَخِيكَ صَدَقَ Smiling at your brother's face is a form of charity. God the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the Holy Prophet and considered him a symbol of mercy and gentleness when he said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً للعالمين. And we have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. One of the companions of the Holy Prophet وسلم, said that when the Holy Prophet would not see one of his companions for three days and that companion is not in his presence, he would ask about him. If he was away, then the Prophet would pray for him. If he was present, then the Prophet would seek him. And if he was sick, then the Prophet would visit him. Prophet Muhammad's mercy extended even to plants and animals. The Holy Prophet وسلم, exhorted his followers to plant trees by saying, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يَذْرَعُ زَرْعًا أَوْ يَغْرِسُ غَرْسًا فَيَأْكُلُ مِنْهُ طَيْرٌ أَوْ إِنْسَانٌ أَوْ بَهِيمَةٌ إِلَّا كَانَتْ لَهُ بِهِ 
sadaqa. Every single Muslim who cultivates or plants a tree, anything of which animals, birds, or humans can eat from is a form of charity, is counted as charity on their behalf. On one occasion, our Holy Prophet saw an animal being abused. So the Prophet came to its defense and said, لا تضرب الدواب على وجوهها فإنها تسبع بحمد الله Do not hit animals on its faces because it praises and glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the only man to spend every moment of his life with the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He has a saying describing the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam where he says, مَنْ رَآهُ بَدِيهَةً هَابَهُ وَمَنْ خَالَطَهُ مَعْرِفَةً أَحَبَّهُ لَمْ أَرَى قَبْلَهُ وَلَا بَعْدَهُ مِثْلَهُ Those who saw him were in awe and reverence of him. And those who interacted with him were enamored by him. I have never seen anyone like him before him nor after him. It is narrated that once an eloquent Jew came to Umar ibn al-Khattab during the times of his rulership. He told him, describe the akhlaq, the moral characters, the morality of your prophet. Umar said, ask Bilal, for he is more knowledgeable about it than me. So that man went to Bilal. Bilal referred him to the house of Fatima, to Lady Fatima al-Zahra, sallamullahi alayha. She referred him to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, when he saw this man, he told him, صف لي متاع الدنيا حتى أصف لك أخلاقا. Describe the provisions, the enjoyments, the comforts of this world, mata'a dunya So I will describe the moral characters, the morals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That Jew said that it's not easy to do so. How can I describe the comforts, the enjoyments of all this world? It's too much. It's going to take forever to describe all that. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, and I want you to pay attention to this. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, Ajista an wasfi dunya, an wasfi mata'i dunya, wa qad shahid Allah ala qillatih. You were not able to describe the provisions, the comforts, the enjoyments of this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that it is little. It's not much. Allah says, قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيل Say the provisions of this world are short and little. فَكَيْفَ أَصِفُ لَكَ أَخْلَاقَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وقد شهد الله تعالى بأنه عظيم When Allah, and how, so how can I describe the morals of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam when Allah the Almighty said that these, his morals are great and exalted. Where in the ayah, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And most surely you conform yourself to sublime and exalted morality. Greatness and gloriousness become even greater and even more gr glorious by the one who is describing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest, is the one who is, who is describing the greatness of the morals of his chosen Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Yet, even 
though we know that our prophet or our prophet is known for his sublime uh, morality and his noble character, yet you still see or we still hear a misconception that is repeated over and over again in the media in various uh, words in various forms. by those who have at least, at least they have a misconception about Islam. If they do not have certain agendas that are running behind them. What is this misconception that we always hear about Islam in the biased media? Islam is, a, is an evil religion. Islam is a bad religion. It promotes violence. Muhammad is a vicious, is a cruel man. He's a violent man. All these reports, I'm sure you've seen it on the news. Here and there, it's being said in different ways and different forms. All this bias comes from the stereotype that the Arabs forced the non-Arabs to the Islamic faith. So the question is, did Islam spread in the world by sword? or by conversion. So in tonight's speech, I will look into the following five points. One, does Islam compel people by the sword or does it show the opposite? Number two, how did, Isla how did the Holy Prophet spread Islam in Mecca? Number three, how did the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Spread Islam in Medina. Point number four. What is the greatest achievement of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is mentioned in the Quran, according to the Quran? And number five. What about the expansion of the Muslim empire after the demise of our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We will look at these points, inshallah, after a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So the first point, did, uh, does Islam compel people by the sword or does it show the opposite? To be able to answer this question, let us first look at the issue of conversion by force from a Quranic perspective. What does the Quran, the Muslim holy book, the book, the, the last message of Allah to mankind, what does the Quran say about this issue? If we open up Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse 256, Allah says, لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينِ قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّجْدُ مِنَ الْغَيْ فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوِثْقَى لَنْفِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ There is no compulsion in religion. Verily, guidance has become clear from error. So whosoever rejects the idols and believes in God, he has laid hold onto the most firm rope which will not break. God is all hearing, all knowing. What does the verse start with? La ikraha fiddin. There is no compulsion in religion. Clearly. There can be no force in accepting Islam. Why? Because Islam wants sincere belie believers. Allah wants sincerity from us. This is why we always, we always discuss niyyah, the intention of each deed that you do. That the niyyah is an essential part of each amal, each practice, each action that you do. Islam wants sincere believers. If you force someone into believing in something, what would that happen? What, what will happen to this person? He will become a hypocrite. He will not believe truly, sincerely. Maybe in front of you he'll show because you're stronger than him. But in reality, in his heart, 
who will believe? If you compel someone on doing, to do something, you will not get the best results. Allah wants us to be sincere. And if you force someone into religion, you will not get sincerity. You will increase the numbers of hypocrites who are disbelievers in the heart, not the number of true believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse in Surah Al-Ghashiyah, verses 21 and 22, where he describes the Prophet and Allah says that he is a reminder, not a person who forces Islam upon others. What does Allah say? فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرْ Therefore remind them for you are only a reminder. You are not a controller over them. In many other verses, the Holy Prophet is being described as a bearer of good news, a warner of God's punishment. Inna arsalnaka bil bashiran wa nadira. His role was just to remind people of their natural instinct, of their fitra of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the first verse that I recited and I started the majlis with, explained, force is not needed. La ikraha fid din. Why is force not needed? Qad rushdu min al -ghay. The right way is clearly distinct from the crooked way, from the wrong way. And Allah gave human beings the power of choice. And he clearly showed us the right way from the wrong way. So there is no need to compel someone into, into, into coming into the folds of Islam. According to Islam's holiest book, the Holy Quran. So according to the Quran, there is no compelling nor, nor force in accepting the religion of Allah. This will lead us to the second point, how did the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam spread Islam in Mecca? Now we know what the Quran says, but let's look at the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. How did he spread it? The Holy Prophet spent the first 13 years of his mission in the holy city of Mecca. He and the Muslims during these 13 years were a minority in Mecca. They were not even the majority. They were a minority. Most of the people of Mecca did not accept the message of the Holy Prophet during the first 13 years of his mission. So force is inconceivable. It's a historical impossibility. How can you force someone when you're weak? You can only force someone into something when you're stronger. When you're the minority, and most of your followers are not from even the high class in that society, you don't even have the strength. Actually, in the first 13 years, Muslims were persecuted and tortured it was actually that persecution from the people of Mecca that led our Holy Prophet وسلم, to migrate from Mecca to Medina. The Holy Prophet وسلم, was ridiculed, was attacked, was mocked by the people of Mecca to the extent that the Holy Prophet said, مَا أُذِيَ نَبِيٌّ بِمِثْلِ مَا أُذِيتُ no prophet was hurt and ridiculed just as I was hurt and ridiculed. How was the prophet ridiculed? What did the people of Mecca do to him? They did a lot. I'll give you a few scenes of what they used to do to him. They used to throw rubbish, trash on the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those polytheists. What did the prophet respond to them? Did he fight them? Did he kill them? Did he, did he reply by violence? Did he use violence? No. 
Yasir and Sumayya, they are the first martyrs in Islam. They were tortured by the polytheists for accepting the message of the Holy Prophet The Prophet saw them being tortured. He was not able to save them. He saw them being killed. How did he reply? Did he fight? Did he, do, did he use violence? No. Bilal al-Habashi. Because he went against the will of his master by accepting the message of the Holy Prophet They brought him in the heat of the summer, in the middle of the day. And they laid him on the scorching sands of the deserts of Mecca. In the middle of that day. And they placed a huge rock on his chest. And he kept saying, Ahadun, Ahad. There is only one, there is only one God. Did the Prophet reply by violence? No. They left the Holy Prophet in the valley of Abu Ta Abi Talib, Sha'ab Abi Talib. Economic sanction was applied on the Holy Prophet. No food, no drink, no transaction is allowed to be done with the Holy Prophet Did the Prophet reply by violence or killing? No, he did not. He saw all his companions being tortured and persecuted in Mecca till he ordered them to migrate to Abyssinia. And he told Ja'far al-Tayyar, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Ja'far al-Tayyar, that there is a just ruler in Abyssinia. So you Muslims go and migrate to Abyssinia to be saved from that persecution of the infidels and the polytheists of Mecca. He did not respond by violence. He did not respond by killing. They remained in Abyssinia till when? The seventh year after the Holy Prophet migrated to Medina. The seventh year after Hijrah. They called our Holy Prophet a, a sahir, a magician, a poet, a sha'ar. They called him a majnoon, a madman. Did he reply by violence? No, he did not. Thirteen years in Mecca. He was ridiculed, mocked. His followers were tortured and persecuted. And Allah never allowed him to fight. So where is the violence? How did Islam spread in Mecca? Through force or through the Prophet's noble character and his efforts in propagating Allah's message. That's Mecca. Now the question is, how did, uh, how did the Prophet spread Islam in Medina? What about Medina? The last 10 years of the Prophet's life and the Prophet's mission was where in the holy city of Medina. The Holy Prophet lived over there. The majority of the people of Medina were from which tribes? Al Aus and Al Khazraj. These are two big tribes that lived in the city of Medina. The majority of them have accepted Islam over there before the Prophet even reaches Medina before the Prophet even migrated to that city. Obviously, how did they accept Islam? By force? Or they accepted Islam because they hear the beauty of the Prophet's words. And, the and they understood the beauty of the values that the Prophet is propagating. They accepted it by conversion. They thought about it. The Prophet sent he sent a youth to the people of Medina to teach them and to propagate the message. And when they hear the beauty of the message of the Holy Prophet وسلم, they accepted it. Who wouldn't accept this beautiful message of the Holy Prophet? 
the Holy Prophet and his followers in Mecca weren't able to, ser to save themselves. Can they force anyone outside? No. Physically, it's impossible for them. So people in Medina accepted Islam through propagation only. Not by force. Not by the power of sword. Once the Holy Prophet وسلم, settled in the city of Medina, he noticed that there was a minority Jewish community living in that city and they had no inclination in accepting the message of Islam. What did the Prophet do? He met them. He invited them to a pact with the Muslims so that each religious group in Medina knows its rights and obligations. The Prophet established the Charter of Medina. And, and I advise all of you to search the Charter of Medina and read that Charter. And look at how the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam protected the rights of all people, whether they're Muslims or none. In that charter, I will read uh, some excerpts from it. He says, the Holy Prophet says, the Jews who enter into this covenant shall be protected from all insults and vexations. They shall have an equal right as our people to our assistance and good offices. The Holy Prophet is promoting peaceful coexistence. 1400 years ago, not now. 1400 years ago. He says the Jews of the various branches shall form with the Muslims one composite nation. They shall practice their religion as freely as the Muslims are practicing theirs giving them equal rights. The clients, the allies of the Jews shall enjoy the same security and freedom as the allies of the Muslims. The interior of Yathrib shall be a sacred place for whoever accepts this charter. The clients and the allies of the Muslims and of the Jews shall be as respected as the principles this clearly shows the charter of medina remember that this clearly shows that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam did not force anyone to accept islam even in the city which he has political power over he promoted that peaceful coexistence and here we are proud to be living in a society where multiculturalism and peaceful coexistence is being promoted. Our Holy Prophet ﷺ promoted that in the holy city of Medina 1400 years ago. So now we know about his life in Mecca and the first and the beginning of his life in Medina. A question might arise. Okay, okay. We know that the Prophet is peaceful here and there. But what about the battles that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam fought when he established his political power in Medina? Wasn't the aim of these battles to impose Islam on others? That's a question that might arise. So to answer this question, I want to look at a few of the major battles that went between Muslims and the enemies of Islam. Let's look at the first battle. In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet the first major battle happened by the name of the Battle of Badr. Badr is a place, is a well that is between Mecca and Medina. 80 miles away from Medina and 200 miles away from Mecca. Just the location and the circumstances of this battle is enough of an answer that the ones who were the aggressors are the people, the infidels of Mecca. 
they had to travel 200 miles. And if they were able to go more, they would to go fight the Holy Prophet. So the location is so close to Medina. Just the location and the circumstances is an answer that the aggressors were the infidels of Mecca, not the followers of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. The second major battle that occurred in the third year after Hijrah, the Battle of Uhud. Uhud is a mountain that is just outside Medina, just outside Medina. The Meccan unbelievers, they came all the way from Mecca to fight the Prophet and the Muslims in Medina, to take their revenge from their loss and their defeat in Badr. So what do you expect someone to do? Let them come in the house? Or you would go outside the city and defend your people and you def defend your families and defend the women? Uhud is just a mountain outside Medina. If anyone gets a tawfiq to visit the holy city of Medina, currently it's inside the city of Medina, not too far away from the Prophet's mosque. You can even go walking. It's that close. So Muslims had to defend the city. And they went beside the, 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 the mountain of Uhud, which is just outside Medina. So were they attacking or were they defending? Let's look at a third major battle. In the year five after Hijrah, there was a battle by the name of the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench. The Meccan infidels and the Jews of Northern Arabia, they came together to fight Muslims and to end Islam in Medina. And why is it called the Battle of the Trench? Muslims wanted to defend their cities. So they dug a trench all around the city of Medina. Why? So the enemies would not enter and attack their own cities. So were they fighting, attacking, or were they defending? These battles that the Holy Prophet ﷺ had to undertake were all in defense. He wasn't attacking. The Prophet does not need the sword to convince someone. The noble character of the Prophet, the exalted morality of the Prophet is more than enough to convince someone of the Tr the truth of this message, the greatness of this message. So this leads us to the fourth point. What is the greatest achievement according to the Holy Quran? What is the greatest achievement of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam that he achieved in his life? The greatest achievement happened when in the year six after Hijrah, when he signed a peace treaty by the name of the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, Sulh al Hudaybiyyah. What's the story of this treaty? In the year six after Hijrah, the Holy Prophet and the Muslims, they wanted to perform pilgrimage uh, in the holy city of Mecca. So they went without any arms to offer pilgrimage. They're going to visit the house of Allah. When the Meccan infidels, they heard about the Muslims coming to Mecca to perform pilgrimage, what did they do? They came outside the city of Mecca in an area called Hudaybiyah, and they prevented the Muslims from coming forward. After lengthy negotiations between the Muslims and the non-believers, they reached an agreement and both parties signed a peace treaty for the term of 10 years. For the term of 10 years. Once this treaty was uh, signed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the verse 
inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Surely we have given you a great victory, a clear victory. So what's the implications of this treaty that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam signed with the emperor? First, until the signing of this treaty in the sixth year, in the six years before this treaty, when the Prophet migrated to Medina till year six, these six years, Muslims were mostly busy defending themselves against the enemies who come and attack them from all sides, from the north, from the south, and everywhere. So they were always busy defending themselves, trying to protect their land, to trying to protect themselves, their families. They did not have a lot of time and a lot of uh, um, uh, resources to go and propagate all over Arabia, all over the world. So they were busy defending themselves. After signing this treaty, the Muslims became free. They don't need to defend themselves anymore because their enemies, their external enemies, the Meccans, and the internal enemies cannot do anything anymore. Only after signing the treaty, the Muslims felt safe and secure to travel all around uh, the regions and the countries outside Medina. So they started traveling. The peace treaty gave Muslims an opportunity to have an organized mission, an on organized propagation, uh, uh, missionary work, organized missionary works and or organized uh, propagation campaigns to promote and propagate the message of Islam. So Muslims, instead of being busy defending themselves, they started working on propagating the message, informing people of the beauty of this message. To the extent that from the year 6 to the year 9 after Hijrah, in these three years, year 9 was known as Amul Wufud, the year of the delegates. So much missionary work has been done in these three years that in the ninth year was, it was known as Amul Wufud because so many delegates from various Arab tribes and various countries near, uh, various countries and regions near um, in, in, the, in the Arabian Peninsula, they came to announce the, uh, and declare their, their uh, to declare their faith in front of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. They all came to accept, to declare the acceptance of Islam. Within three years, most of Ara the Arabian Peninsula came under the folds of Islam. How? Through propagation. So when, the, when Allah said, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina, within three years, all of the Arabian Peninsula was changed. How? Through propagating the message. When people know the beauty of the words of Ahlul Bayt, they will follow. When people know the beauty and the values of the Holy Prophet, they would follow. So this peace treaty gave a chance for Islam to spread all over. Which will lead us to the fifth question. What about the expansion of the Muslim empire after the demise of the Holy Prophet? Now we're talking about the during the time of the Holy Prophet, everything was peaceful. Very good. What about after the Holy Prophet? the Muslim empire has expanded greatly after the demise of the Holy Prophet And some of these expansions were not uh, through propagation, but through military and fights and wars. So what do we say about that? What do we, the Shias of Ahlul Bayt, say about that? I have no hesitation to say that some of those rulers 
were more interested in their pockets, in what comes to their pockets, than to convert people to Islam. They didn't fight people and conquer lands to make them accept the message of the Holy Prophet. They conquered lands to make sure people pay tributes and taxes to them so their treasuries get full of money. So their pockets get filled with gold. Those rulers, they were more interested in the pleasures of this world. They weren't interested in the faith of people. They were in the business they were not in the business of promoting and spreading the Islamic faith. That's why in the majority of the cities, the inhabitants continue to follow their own religion. Actually, the conquerors, the Muslim conquerors, they made sure to sign treaties guaranteeing that the conquered people will have the freedom to practice the religion as long as they pay tribute to that ruler. So all what they were interested in is the tribute, the money. That money enters the treasury of the caliphs. In addition to that, rulers who are not infallible, rulers who are not sinless, rulers who are not appointed by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam or chosen by God, those rulers do not represent Islam. The only ones that represent Islam are the, is the Prophet and the infallible, sinless successors and imams of the Prophet, uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. The Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim, they are the ones that represent Islam. And they did not fight and do that. Look at the government of Amir al mumin Did they go and expand the Muslim lands? It didn't happen during that time. Let us look at examples of Muslim history, just to prove this point. Muslims have governed or ruled India for over 800 years. During the history of India, you will never see a time where there was a majority of Muslims. If they were there to compel people and force them into Islam, then you should see a majority of Muslims while in these 800 years, while the Muslims were ruling. However, you will never see in the history of India, especially during these 800 years, a majority of Muslims. Until now, Muslims in India, there are many, but they're not the majority. They're minority. Look at Greece, which is a neighboring country to Turkey. The Ottoman Empire ruled over Greece, conquered Greece for 500 years. Until now, until today, there is no sizable minority of Muslims in Greece. Not even a sizable minority. So did these caliphs spread Islam? Or were they there just to control land and gain money, gain profits, gain tribute from them? Look at, the country, country, uh, look at Muslim countries in the Far East. Look at Indonesia and Malaysia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. The Muslim army and the Muslim navy never set foot in, India, in, in, in Indonesia and Malaysia. How did Islam reach them? Through businessmen who properly practiced the religion of through scholars who went and propagated the message of Islam over there. When people saw the honesty of these businessmen, when people were introduced to the beautiful values of the Holy Prophet and the message of the Holy Prophet, they 
to the sun. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. And Islam reached them through businessmen who properly practice Islam, who showed them what is Islam through action, not just words, and through the great work, the missionary work of the scholars and ulama. And Malaysia is another big Muslim country. So you notice this expansion that happened after the uh, demise of the Holy Prophet ﷺ was not an expansion to spread Islam. Yes, the land of the Muslims, not Islam, expanded. And the only reason was to so the, that the caliph will ensure more tributes coming into him. That his treasury is always filled with money. They were not in the business of spreading Islam. Islam was spread through the works of those who propagated the message. Look at our countries, countries in the West, Europe and North America. Nowadays, we notice that, that there is a great attack on Islam or a great, uh, a great attack on Islam from the biased media. We notice that they're trying every everything to tarnish the image of Islam. Yet, yet, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the West. Why are people accepting Islam? Are they forced to accept it? No, because they have seen the beauty of this message. They have seen the beauty of the message of Islam. So that's why we Muslims, we should realize that the strongest response to the biased media is our own behavior. Are we truly applying Islam? Are we truly applying the teachings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam? If we portray true Islamic conduct and true Islamic behavior, then our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, colleagues, people who know us will be affected by that. And this will be, and then those people will not believe the negative portrayal that is of Islam that is being done by the media. Allah says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawadatil hasana. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and goodly exhortation. Imam al Sadiq, our sixth Imam alayhi salam, says, Kunu du'atan lana bi ghayri al sinatikum. Call the people towards Islam without using your tongue. The Imam is saying, not by words, but by your actions, you can affect people. Your behavior at home, your behavior in school, your behavior in college, your behavior in your workplace is the best response to the biased media that is trying to tarnish the image of Islam. And our own action is the best way to portray the true message of Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is the life of our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. A life that is nothing but mercy, peace, kindness, and charity to the world. However, on a day like this, the day of the 28th of Safar, when our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam was about to pass away. He asked for a pen and paper to write a will that if it is followed, no one will ever go astray. The companions who the Prophet showed them nothing but mercy. The companions who the Prophet showed them nothing but compassion throughout his life, they openly disobeyed him and they openly prevented him from writing the will. Umar said, Sickness has overcome the Prophet. Hasbuna kitab Allah, the Quran is sufficient for us. He openly disgraced and insulted the Holy Prophet 
he forgot about the verses which describe the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa ma yantiq anil hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha nor does he speak of his out of his desire he is not but a revelation that is revealed the prophet asked them to leave and not to stay in his house ibn abbas says that the greatest calamity for islam was that the discord and dispute of some of the companions prevented the prophet from writing the deed which he intended to write Calamities will start befalling on the household of the Holy Prophet after his departure. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied what is going to come. He says, Fitness, trials have come like parts of the dark night. Abu Rafa, the, the servant, servant of the messenger of, the messenger of Allah, of Allah sallallahu wa sallam, narrates that when, that it, when was it was the day, the, day the, messenger the messenger of Allah passed away, away. He, went he went unconscious. unconscious. I, took I took his feet and kissed them and while crying. crying. He woke he up as I was saying, Malli wali wali ba'daka ya Rasulallah. Who will be will there, be for, there me for me and, and my progeny, progeny after you, O oh messenger of Allah? Allah. The, prophet the prophet raised his head. His head. He, he said, said that Allah ba'di wa wasi salih al mu'minin. Allah will be there to take care of you. And after me, my successor, the best of the believers, will be there to take care of you. Meaning Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. In a narration, when the Holy Prophet's death drew near, Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra spoke to her father, saying, Ya Abata, ala tukallimuni kalima, fa inni anzaru ilayk, wa araka mufariq al-dunya, wa ara asakir al-maut, taghshaka shadida, oh father, Will you not speak to me even one word? For I see you leaving this world. And I see that death is overwhelming you strongly. The Prophet ﷺ, he opened his eyes and said, Daughter, yes. I am going to leave you, so peace be from me upon you. On that day, on that day, the Holy Prophet turned to Amir al-Mu'mineen as the hand of Fatima was in his hand. He placed her hand in the hand of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then he said, Ya Aba al-Hasan, هذه وديعة الله ورسوله محمد عندك فاحفظ الله واحفظني فيها وإنك لفاعل أو فاضر أو حسن this is Allah's trust and his messenger's trust with you. So take good care of her and you shall do so. Ya Ali, hadihi wallah sayyidatun nisa min al-awwalina wal-akhirin. Hadihi wallah maryam al-kubra. O Ali, by Allah she is the messenger of all women from the first and last this is the greater Mary until the Prophet says وَعْلَمْ يَا عَلِي إِنِّي رَاضٍ عَمَّنْ رَضِيَتْ عَنْهُ بْنَتِي فَاطِمَةً وَكَذَلِكَ رَبِّي وَمَلَائِكَةً 
O Ali, know that I am pleased with whoever and my daughter Fatima is pleased with the same for my Lord and his angels. Ya Ali, waylon liman zalamaha, waylon liman ibtazaha aqaha, wa waylon liman hataka harmataha. O oh, Ali, woe unto the one who oppresses her, woe unto the one who takes her right, and woe unto the one who violates her sanctity. Wailun liman ahraq babaha, wa wailun liman adha khalilaha, wa wailun liman shaqaha wa barazaha, wa hum minni bura. O oh, Ali, woe unto the one that burns her house's door. Woe unto the one who hurts her close friend. Woe unto the one who opposes her, stands against her, and faces her. These people have nothing to do with me. وغمض عيونه وجب لي وقرا الشهادة اقرا الشهادة ومدد شماله ويمينه رسوم المنية بينت عاين جبينه when the Prophet's death approached, Amir al Mu'minin was present with him. When the Prophet's body became heavier and his soul was going to come out, he said, O oh Ali, put your head, put my head in your lap, for death has come. If my soul comes out, receive it with your hand and wipe it on your face. Then direct me towards Qibla, take care of me, wash me, shroud my body, be the first to pray on my body. Do not leave me until you put me in my grave and seek help from Allah the exalted Amir al muminin took his head he puts it in his lap the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi went unconscious ajarakum Allah Lady Fatima threw herself on the Prophet she looked at his face crying and lamenting she said and a white man in which if we ask Allah to bring rain by his face, then rain will fall. He is a supporter for the widows and orphans. Rasulullah opened his eyes. He said in a low voice, Ya Bunayya, hadha qawlu ammik ya Talib. Daughter, this is what your uncle Abu Talib would say. Don't say it. However, say, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلِ أَفَعِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلَ مْقَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ قَابِكُمْ and Muhammad is no more than a messenger. The messengers have already passed away before him. If then he dies or is killed, will you turn back upon your heel?
Lady Fatima cried for a long time. Then the prophet called her to come closer. She came near him. He told her a secret. Her face glowed from happiness. In a narration, Fatima was asked, What did the Messenger of Allah tell you that made your sorrow and worry go away? She said, he informed me that my that I am the first person amongst his household which will return to him. And that it won't be long before I meet him again. That's how my sorrow and worry left me. In another narration, when the Prophet was unconscious, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, they came up screaming and crying. They fell on their grandfather out of their sorrow. Amir al Mu'minin wanted to raise them up, but the Prophet woke up and told him, Ya Ali. Dani Ashumma wa Yashumani Wa Tazawatu Minhuma wa Yatazawajani Minni Oh Ali Let them stay so I can smell them and they can smell me So I can see them more before I go and they can see me more Why O Prophet Ama Annahuma Sayullamani Badi wa Yuqtalani Dhulma Falanatu Allahi ala man yadlimuhuma they will surely be oppressed and killed oppressively after me. So may Allah's curse be upon their oppressor. The Prophet repeated it three times. Then the Holy Prophet stretched his hands toward the Amir al Mu'mineen. He pulled him until they were both under the Prophet's clothing. He spoke to Amir al Mu'mineen secretly until the until his soul came out. Amir al Mu'mineen got up and said, "Adam Allah jurakum fi nabiyyikum, faqad qabadhu Allah ida." May Allah make your rewards great, for Allah has taken the Prophet to him. Great sounds and screams and cryings were heard all over the Medina. Shams al Nubuwati takawarat wa Badr al Hidaab. Ma sana bil alam mithl mithl fakd al Nabi Musab. As for Fatima, she was devastated for what she lost. She was crying. She was weeping bitterly. As if she says, Nurak ya Ibrahim min ghab min ghayab Adlam ala fraqak al mihrab Ujabdi alayk al sadaq Wa naab wa naayab Ulibast al hizn wa al ham Jilbab, Jilbab, Udam al Hassan, Wal Hussain, Sajjaa. Udam al Hassan, Wal Hussain, Sajjaa. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam took care of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam's body. He washed him, he shrouded him, he prayed on his holy body and buried him. Once our Prophet was buried, the Imam sat beside, his, beside the grave crying and weeping. Amir al-Mu'mineen said, Al-Mawt la walidan yubqi wa la walada Hada al-sabilu ila an la tara ahada 
Death does death not does leave not any father, father or son. Or son. Humans, Humans keep, keep going, going through, through death, death until no one is left. Hada Nabi, wa lam yakhlud li ummatihi. Law khalad Allah khalqan qablahu khaluda. This is the Prophet, he did not stay amongst his nation for eternity. If Allah would have made someone before and lived for eternity, he, the Prophet, would have lived for eternity. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zhanamu. بيت رسول الله أي من قلبه ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بأحب الخلق إليك محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسن والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين يا الله أو الله حيث the reappearance of our Imam Imam صاحب العصر والزمان relieve him from all his worries protect him يا الله make him happy with our deeds instill happiness in his heart protect all the مؤمنين around the globe O oh Allah, Allahumma shafi maradana. O oh Allah, heal our sick family members and friends. Heal all the mu'mineen and mu'minat. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Muqallib al-Qulubi wal-Absar. Thabit Qulubana ala deenin. O oh Allah, make us steadfast on the religion of Islam. If you have a need, ask it right now with the sincerity that you have in your heart, with the blessing of the Majlis of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Inshallah, your needs would be answered. Allahumma abdi hawaijana bi jahi rasulillahi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. اللهم ثبتنا على ولاية أمير المؤمنين اللهم ثبتنا على حب أهل البيت وعلى اتباعهم ومودتهم يا الله أو الله please hasten the reappearance of our Imam make him happy with us make him proud with us, with make us him make proud him from our deeds. O oh Allah, Allah, hasten Allah, his reappearance. Let's recite dua and pray together. Allahumma kun li walika al-hujjati ibn al-Hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abayhi fi hadihi sa'a وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي إليهم ثواب المباركة الفاتحة تسبقها صلوات الله